Okay. So since we are going to talk about questionnaires, I thought first we'll look at a sample questionnaire and then let's uh, move on to the actual uh, um, session. Okay. So can you see a sample questionnaire in this uh, screen now? Okay. So this is a, there are several ways that you can prepare questionnaires. Nowadays with technology, you can even do online uh, set uh, online plat platform. Uh, you can prepare questionnaires in that way also. Uh, this is a very basic type of questionnaire. Uh, you can see the way it is done. Okay, so this is just a one page questionnaire. So what do you see at the top is, you see uh, uh, instructions two lines, please put a tick in the box next to the answer of your choice or write in the space provided as the case may be. So you see um, short and simple instructions for those who are going to fill the questionnaire. Although it does not give you uh, the purpose of this questionnaire <clears throat> is something not good, but we'll learn all these things uh, in the coming sessions. Uh, I just wanted to show you some sample questionnaires, okay? So in this one, you see the gender and the age. Usually you do not ask for personal information. So you don't see name, uh, the registration number or um, national ID number or anything like that. We usually do not collect them. Uh, gender and age, uh, there are several ways that you can collect age. Here it is a categorization. Uh, so assuming that the participants are hovering from ages 13 to 19 years only. Okay, so, so these are in years, although it is not indicated. Okay, so hopefully these are in years. So anybody beyond age 19 or below 13 are not in this uh, group. Okay. Then the religion, uh, they have given uh, Christianity. Uh, okay, so this is not in Sri Lanka, so some uh, type of religions. Um, and the family type that they are living in, extended single parent, nuclear sibling house. Um, so do you use drugs? Uh, do you know of at least one teenage in your community that use drugs? So, so you can see that this is about um, drug usage or something like that, okay? And then the next question, if your answer is yes to question two. So what is the question two? Do you use drugs? How often do you use? So frequency is asked, uh, whether they are easily available and so on, okay? Uh, so this is a just a one page a simple questionnaire. So the maybe the objective of the collector is to get an idea about uh, this um, community, whether drug usage is high or low, um, how um, uh, what are the age categories that are highly using drugs, how is what is the availability of them and so on. Okay. Although there are several um, um, flaws in this questionnaire. Okay, just to give you an uh, uh, an idea about how a questionnaire looks like. So here's a simple questionnaire. So we'll look at this one again, come back and see whether there are uh, improvements that you can do. Okay, we'll come back to this questionnaire after we learn um, the techniques. Okay. The next one, it's a little bit different one. Okay, so this one, it is about uh, teacher related factors. Uh, please rate each item as to the extent desire that your mathematics teacher displays the following traits and behavior using the following scale. Now, this is about getting an in output from uh, students about the, their uh, teacher, okay? And the students are going to rank it. It's ranking from one to five, one for never, two rarely and so on, up to five always. So it is kind of ordered ranking. Uh, it is divided into three sections, personality, teaching skills, and instructional materials. So under these three categories, this uh, person actually is a, a researcher, some person, he's going to collect data from the students. So this questionnaire is distributed among students to get some idea about the teaching skills and um, uh, maybe teacher-student relation in this school. So a person who's filling this one, they will either tick or put a uh, cross, maybe a cross or a tick, something like this, okay, while this person is filling this questionnaire. So again, you don't see the name of the student, the class, you don't see anything, not even the name of the teacher. So the name of the teacher may be known by the researcher, 
okay but it is not indicated here so everything is blind okay so that is to uh, uh, maintain the confidentiality so if this uh, questionnaire was um, misplaced anybody who looks at it they do not know who's the student who's the teacher so that should be there only the researcher knows who's and who's these uh, students are evaluating okay so this is uh, another form of uh, collecting data ranking okay so this is one way of doing it i'll show you there are several other methods that you can do ranking okay so these two are just uh, two examples of questionnaires okay so before we move on to uh, uh, learning the techniques and advantages and uh, all those methods about preparing a questionnaire okay <clears throat> we'll look at some other techniques that you can use okay so here's the third section of chapter one that is the last section questionnaire design uh, so forget about the questionnaires for a while what are the other data collection techniques that you can use data collection techniques so now you are in the phase of uh, data collection you have already identified the population you have already figured out your sample sample size and everything so you know your sample okay now you know your sample now you are going to collect data if your data collection is from like a water samples or something like that then you don't need questionnaires or anything you just have to uh, visit each place and collect data for a test tube or something like that okay so those type of experiments or data collection you don't need any techniques like this okay but if you are going to interact with uh, humans okay human or um, any other entity then you have to collect data okay so questionnaire we already know okay so we'll write it what are the other techniques that you can use to collect it now when you say questionnaire they also can come in several you can do online service like online or uh, paper pencil paper pen pencil survey right like print it and distribute it and collect or you can uh, mail them or maybe uh, email them or nowadays you can even use the social media and then get the answers another way is uh, personal interviews usually in medical fields uh, personal interviews are widely used because uh, each patient is it's unique there are several things that you have to collect uh, personally asking from each and every patient so personal interviews although it is um, very time consuming uh, sensitive sometimes because you are you see the uh, your interview right the person who's responding to you you see them so sometimes people are reluctant to um, share some sensitive information uh, so sometimes uh, personal interviews are not giving you um, good output uh, but the question is so there are questions that you have to think twice whether you include it in a questionnaire or whether you ask it in a personal interview so maybe you can combine both you do the personal interview and some sensitive questions if you think that the person who's going to respond to you will be uh, face the difficulties you can put it in a questionnaire and collect it so they do not have to um, say or share information personally okay personal interviews they are also can be done in different ways you can actually do it in person or you can do it over the phone nowadays right uh, you see uh, most often the over the phone interviews are there like um, uh, asking you about the quality of services even from the mobile phone companies you receive them you know, the telecom sometimes uh, uh, after a certain service they provided they give you a phone call and ask uh, whether how to, whether you are satisfied with this um, how do you rate the Uh, customer service uh, person how do you rate the service they gave you uh, whether you recommend it to another person okay things like that they ask over the phone so those are also personal interviews uh, one other way is uh, do observational 
observational uh, methods. So those are the methods, uh, you know, your subject, uh, maybe a patient or a, a student, you do not interact with them in person. Uh, what you do is you just observe, you sit somewhere and you just observe how they behave. And according to that, you collect uh, data. Uh, you know, sometimes if you do uh, a research or study about um, uh, vehicles passing a certain um, junction, okay, what are the, um, how, what is the speed uh, or maybe whether they emit uh, um, gases, uh, things like that, okay, what is the gender of the driver, um, whether they follow the traffic signs correctly, okay, things like that. Uh, you are not going to stop the vehicle and ask it from the driver. You are just sitting beside the road and uh, through observation, you mark it. Okay, here's the first vehicle. This is the make, this is the color. Uh, the driver is a, a male or a female. Whether this person used the correct signal lights, you can tick it, right? That is through observation. Okay, so, and another uh, example is, uh, this is uh, one that I have experienced. Uh, you know, we have the, uh, CKDU in Sri Lanka, you have heard about that disease, right? Uh, the chronic kidney disease of unknown etiology. Uh, so that is very common in North Central province. So a lot of researchers are doing uh, studies on these patients. So these patients have already um, filled questionnaires many, many times, maybe 50, 60 in their uh, whole lifetime. Okay, so these patients. So they are very, uh, they, these questionnaires are very common to them. Even they know the answers they have to provide. Okay, say for example, um, they have been instructed by the medical, um, uh, medical providers to drink this many amount of liters per day. So they know if they are, if according to the stage of their CKDU, uh, they know they have been instructed, okay, you have to drink five liters per day. So they know that, but they maybe you don't know whether actually they drink or not, right? Sometimes they don't. So when these, most of the, these uh, uh, patients are farmers, so when they start working, sometimes very hard labor, they forget to drink, but they know they have to drink five liters, okay? Now, if you give a questionnaire asking how many liters that you are drinking per day, because they know they have to drink five, they put five, although they do not drink, okay? Then you won't get the actual answer. So in such situations, what researchers do is they go to the field and from the morning to the uh, evening, they stay at the field and observe these farmers, how they are working, whether they carry a bottle with them and they drink while they work. Okay? And through the observations, they see whether they actually drink five liters or only one bottle, only two bottles. They, that is how they, these people are now doing. Otherwise, you won't get the exact uh, actual answer because these uh, patients are very um, you know, practiced about questionnaires and they know the answers they have to give, although they do not follow these instructions. And they have been instructed to wear long sleeves uh, to reduce dehydration, wear caps, uh, boots, uh, the, um, everything that will protect from uh, pesticides and even the, sunrise, the, sun, the sunlight but sometimes they do not use, but if a questionnaire is given, they will put, yes, they use, because they know they have to. Only through observation, a person can see whether they actually use these um, uh, personal uh, equipments or not. Okay, so in such situations, you have to go for observational data collection techniques. Uh, <clears throat> any other methods that you can come up with? How do you collect data? Can you uh, can do interviews, questionnaires, observation? Uh, sometimes you uh, do the surveys, which are just the public surveys, but sometimes paid. Okay. Or rewarded. Uh, so you have to answer some questions and then you will be entered into a, a certain draw. Okay, so that is one way of attracting people to questionnaires. Okay, sometimes, uh, usually um, marketing people, they do not identify the sample uh, as 
a single person or entity. What they do is they distribute their questionnaire or a survey public to everybody. So anybody who's using Gmail, okay, you will get this um, survey. And in that survey, it says, if you fill this survey, you will be eligible to enter a certain draw. And uh, you will enter that draw. And from that draw, um, we never know, somebody will win, okay? Maybe a laptop, maybe a, a Kindle, okay? Things like that. Uh, or sometimes in some countries like USA, they even send money through mail to fill the survey and uh, post it back, okay? Uh, so some people, they just take the money and throw away the uh, questionnaire. But some people, actually genuine people, uh, because they got money sometimes, usually they, have you heard about the Nielsen, the Nielsen survey? Okay, they do the surveys on uh, broadcasting companies, the TV stations, radio stations, uh, measure the, you know, to give the ratings, even in Sri Lanka, the Nielsen service are there. So Nielsen is a company, a worldwide company who, conduct surveys to uh, decide the ratings of uh, broadcasting companies. So they usually send their questionnaires, so sometimes booklets to fill for a whole week. And they actually insert money, maybe $5 bill or $3 bills, okay? So likewise. And they ask you to fill it uh, for a whole week, watch the TV, how many hours you watched, how which, which channel, which TV, uh, uh, which news, you know, like that. You have to fill it for a whole week for the whole family and then post that booklet back. They will send you a, uh, uh, an envelope with the stamp also. So you have to fill it honestly and send it back. And even in the, in somewhere in the middle of the week, you will receive a reminder, a reminder letter again with maybe few dollars, right? And then at the end of the week, you have to post it. After you post it and then they received it, again, they will send you some money thanking you. So that is how the Nielsen's do in USA. I don't know, no, it's not here in Sri Lanka likewise. But so those are also public service. So you do not know whether you get the respond or not, but uh, most of the people, they, uh, well, they do this type of service, okay? So these are a few of the data collection techniques in addition to questionnaires, okay? But uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this course, uh, because you are more um, uh, prone to collect data from patients, hospitals, and that medical setup, um, the questionnaires are the uh, main data collection technique that we are going to look at, okay? Do you have any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, now how many of you have uh, done questionnaires as the respondent? You receive a questionnaire from someone and fill it and hand it over. I'm sure you have the, uh, every semester at the end, you have to um, do the review, right? The review for your uh, teacher, right? your lecturer. So you, I think you answer those questionnaires. Uh, Anybody else who have done questionnaires uh, outside the university? Online surveys or telephone interviews? Anybody? I would like to um, hear their um, experience about that questionnaire, whether they were happy to answer the questionnaire, was it too long, too short, easy to understand? Okay, any uh, comments on that? Anybody who want to volunteer who have answered questionnaires in their life? No one? I'm sure at least one of you have uh, done a questionnaire, right? No volunteers? Nobody? Okay, anyway, while we are doing it, uh, we can think about the experience you got, okay? So questionnaires, it's a data collection instrument used to collect standardized information. Uh, uh, this is good or appropriate if you want information from a lot of people. 
Okay, so if you have a limited number of uh, people to collect data, I'll say about 25 or 30, doing a personal interview will be okay. Okay, um, maybe go, uh, meeting them two or three days, a uh, personal interview um, can do it. But if you have to collect information from more than 100, about 500 or 1000, doing personal interviews, it's not going to be practical. Okay, so whenever you have to collect information from many people, question as is a very good method. And also you should have some understanding of the situation and you know what are the questions you have to uh, get, okay? So you should be thoroughly uh, aware about the objectives of your study and uh, how you are going to collect this information. What are the questions that you are going to ask? You should be well I understood about those things. And if then you can prepare a questionnaire very nicely, covering all the objectives, then you can distribute. And questionnaires are good, as I mentioned earlier, if the information is sensitive or private. Okay, so people are more willing to answer anonymously. So they, they do not see the face, they do not know who's going to read it or anything. So that is the anonymous, right? Um, so in such situations, sensitive information, like the previous one about the drug use, if you ask a person whether you use drug, do you think they will say yes? Right? Usually, it's uh, it's not not a thing that you should we would like to share with anyone, right? Uh, it's something personal. So, in such situation, uh, uh, personal interview will not give you actual answers. Okay. So, in such situations, sensitive private questions, questionnaires will be the best method, and it will reduce bias. Okay, bias means um, depending on the person who's asking the question and answering the question. Okay, so if you, uh, if you're the person who's collecting your information is uh, uh, someone, someone you know, uh, your teacher or a lecturer, sometimes you will not be um, um, uh, comfortable in answering some type of questions, right? So it will give you bias, right? So in that situation, questionnaires are the best thing. So, so here are some advantages and disadvantages of questionnaires. If you look at the advantages, it can reach large number of people. It provides anonymity, that means anonymous, uh, unknown, identities uh, hidden. You can say it is confidential. And it's relatively inexpensive, right? Time uh, uh, in both money and time. Okay. You can collect information very quickly. And also uh, if you are using um, social media or emails, you don't have to uh, use any postal um, uh, charges or anything. Okay, so just send one email to uh, about 1,000 people, one click. So it's um, very time consuming. Uh, very um, uh, it will save a lot of your time and money. Okay, and uh, according to the way you prepare your questions uh, in your uh, the way you design your questions, it is very easy to analyze. It is easy to analyze. Uh, sometimes, uh, usually, what we do is after you prepare the questionnaire, you put it into a spreadsheet, maybe Excel or Open Office, a spreadsheet where you put each question number in columns and rows will be the each uh, participant. And then you enter the data in that spreadsheet. If you use a, an online, like a Google a sheet or something, Google, um, uh, Google survey, then the, your, uh, the answers will be automatically saved into a spreadsheet already. So you don't have to enter anything by hand. It will be automatically saved into a Google sheet. So what you have to do is just analyze it. So it is very easy. But there are some disadvantages. You might not get careful or honest information. Okay, that happens uh, the way you design your questionnaire. Okay, Usually if the questionnaire is very long, okay, two pages, maybe three pages, it's okay. But you know, sometimes people prepare questionnaires. It's, it's like a, um, a sheet like uh, 10, 12, 20 pages. 
So somewhere in the middle, the person who's answering the, these, this, the respondents, they get very tired or lazy. So they give up, just stick whatever they want and submit it. So that is uh, very careless, dishonest information. That happens um, if the questionnaire is very large or the questions are um, um, not meaningful or understandable to the public. Okay, that can happen. So that means if, when you are preparing a questionnaire, you have to consider those things, right? The questionnaire should be interesting, easy to understand and short. Okay, otherwise uh, the respondents will get lazy at somewhere middle and you will end up with um, dishonest information, okay? A wording can bias client's response. Sometimes the way you write the question, it can be, it will be understandable in a um, different way. Okay, so that is one disadvantage in questionnaires. That is why we do something called the pilot studies. Okay, that means you prepare the questionnaire and distribute it among some, some of your close um, contacts, maybe your friends, relations, just to get a feedback about your questions, whether they can understand the question correctly, uh, whether the question actually reflects what you wanted to ask. Okay. Sometimes by looking at the answers, we can say, okay, although I'm asking this question, these people have understood something else. Okay, so that means you have to change the wording of your questionnaire, right? So that is why we do a pilot study usually. Okay, a pilot study will give you an idea about whether you have to refresh the questions, whether you have to make your questionnaire shorter, whether there are unnecessary questions, then you can drop them, or whether you have missed any important questions, then you have to include them, okay? So our pilot study is always encouraged with questionnaires. Uh, one other thing is the response rate, okay? The response rate. That means you distribute 100 questionnaires, but you will get only 75. So what is the response rate? 75%. If you distribute this among, if you know your uh, sample entities personally and distribute it, you can go and collect it. Okay, or maybe you distribute in a certain clinic uh, at the beginning of the clinic and collect it before they, they go. So in that way, you'll get 100% of your response. But if you mail your questionnaire or email through email or social media, sometimes you may not get the response back from everybody. Okay, so that is one uh, problem with questionnaire. If you distribute it um, or mail it or email it electronically, sometimes you will not get it back. Okay, so you'll end up with low response rate. And the next one is the, you need the literacy skill, you should know how to read. Uh, so usually in Sri Lanka, when you prepare questionnaires, you have to uh, do the translations, uh, both English, both the Sinhala and Tamil uh, and English. So all three languages are usually encouraged with questionnaires in Sri Lanka. So if there is a person who cannot read, uh, you should be able to sit with that person and explain it and get the answers. Okay, so person with the, uh, the same language, you have to refresh the question to the respondent and get his or her answer and mark it by yourself. So that you have to do if you end up with the person who do not know how to read, that can sometimes happen. Okay, so those are a few of the disadvantages and uh, some advantages of Questionnaires. But while you are, um, while we are continuing this session, you will end up with some other advantages and disadvantages. These are just the uh, common ones. Okay. Right. So these are the things that you have to check before you distribute a questionnaire to your sample. The appropriateness. You have to consider the literacy level. Okay. So that is why what I said. The, the questionnaire when you are going to distribute it, you should know. Okay, everybody in my sample, they know how to read at least one language. They know how to read. So according to the language they prefer, you can give the questionnaire. Maybe English, Sinhala, or Tamil. Okay. Uh, some people, although they know how to read and write, they are very uh, reluctant to do that. This is a tradition, right? They don't um, like to use pens and pencils and sit down and do it. Okay. So in that case, you have to do uh, personally get the information by talking to them and uh, record it. Again, there can be bias, but if uh, people are not ready to read and write, then you have to do that. Um, 
so that is the tradition of reading and writing and oral tradition so this should this is actually the same thing okay so if people are more uh, like with the oral tradition speaking and giving the, the information then the reading and writing will not be suitable so you have to do it personal type peers personal interview type okay then about the translations that what i mentioned uh, you have to use uh, all three language in sri lanka okay mm, how cultural traits affect responses uh, or response sets there are some uh, situations or some questions that may have a cultural uh, background so we have to make sure how you handle those things okay uh, and then how to sequence the question this is very important okay what is the sequence which which question should come first which should be next and so on there should be a proper sequence in the questions i'll show you some examples later uh, about how to keep this sequence okay and then you have to do this is the most important one you have to pre test your questionnaire that is what i call the pilot study you have to pre test your questionnaire and uh, before you give it to the actual sample do a pilot study pre test it and if there are changes to be done you have to do it okay so that is how you check appropriateness sometimes uh, questionnaires you can even decide whether these questions are appropriate or not there are statistical tests okay we are not going to cover those uh, up, we are not going into that deep okay in this course but when you do pilot study and if you analyze there are statistical tests that you can check whether a certain question should be in the questionnaire or not if it is not then you can drop it from the uh, questionnaire okay right um so you have to check your questions <clears throat> when you develop a good questionnaire you should know what you want to find out okay so this is important you should know what you want to find out uh you should not use jargons jargons means the technical terms okay technical terms what are the technical terms if you think about the medical field there are certain uh, you say uh, sbp right you think everybody the general public all of them they know what this sbp means maybe some people not right um crp what is the crp value right so this is uh, this is not the although it is in a um, your medical report what this stands for uh, it is not known for many people right even some technical terms in technology like uh, uh something like um, you know if you ask about the internet do you use 4g 3 you know there are different types you use sometimes uh, some people they are not aware about those things okay so you should not use jar jargon means the technical terms so only if there are terms uh, only the medical people know you should not use those uh, abbreviations you have to write them in the actual wording okay what is the meaning of that you should know very thoroughly your audience or your sample okay so who's going to complete my questionnaire you should know properly okay this is the set i'm going to distribute it so you know okay these people are uh, okay with reading these languages are okay they know how to read and write um, they have a certain knowledge about whatever the a uh, study that you are going to do okay so you should know about your audience then you should go with the clear questions always double check your questions read 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 and read and see whether it actually ask the question you want okay and even this can be done with the pilot testing okay if the question is um, the wording is not correct your pilot test will show you okay whether you have to rephrase the question or not okay if you do all these things then you are ready to consider your questionnaire to the okay or you are ready to distribute your questionnaire to your identified sample okay right so now let's see how we can develop a good questionnaire so it's not easy actually although it may be just one side 
questionnaire with only five questions. Still, it is not going to be easy. Okay, it will take a lot of time, a lot of time, and again, a lot of time. You may write the same question many, many times, cut it, write it again, cut it, write it again. Okay, you have to make sure it is correct. Okay, so you will end up with multiple draft. Not always the first question is, uh, will be your final one, even a dozen. Okay, you uh, again, you test it and then rewrite it again, do a pilot study, then again, you have to rewrite it. Okay, so likewise, you have to, you may end up with multiple graphs. You modify it again and again and again, and finally you end up with the satisfied one. Okay, so it is always good to work with others when developing questionnaire. Okay, that is what I said. Do a pilot study, give it to some of your friends, close friends, and see how they answer the questions. They will say, okay, this question I don't understand. What are you asking here? Then they will tell you, oh, if you asked it in this way, I should have understood. Now, so according to that, you can change the wording of the question. Okay, so always do a pilot test. Okay. So when, when you prepare a questionnaire, it's always good. Many eyes see it, okay, not only two eyes. So maybe three, four people again, you sit together, revise it, rewrite it, revise it again, and so on, okay? Also, you have to uh, identify the features of your respondents. So respondents, those are the people who are going to, who will answer your questionnaire. These are the people who will answer the questionnaire. They are called the respondents. Okay, so they should know their educational background as we discussed earlier, they, you should know whether they are literacy level, what language they uh, speak, whether you have to um, do it as a personal interview and get the uh, results back. Okay, whether these topics are sensitive, uh, uh, whether you have to, uh, you know, do it in the double blind way, okay? Okay, things like that, you have to uh, think twice, okay? And also how you are going to administrate this questionnaire, okay? How are you going to administrate? Um, as I mentioned, if you are going to collect some patient, uh, collect uh, data from patients in a certain clinic, suppose the clinic, uh, the patients are coming on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, okay? let's say the uh, Candy Hospital. So you know that the patients are coming on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at eight o'clock to 12. So if you want to cover these patients, maybe 10 per day, what you have to do is you have to visit the premises, get all the um, ethical clearance, uh, permission and everything. You carry your 10 questionnaires with you distribute it maybe randomly, whatever the, uh, according to the way you have identified your sample, you distribute it and you make sure everything is correctly filled and then you collect it back. You don't get any information, personal information okay, from the patients. You only get the answers and collect them back. So you have the 10 questionnaires from the first day. Then you go on the next day and do it. You know, likewise, that is how you administer it. If you are just going to email the questionnaire, you have to make sure you give a deadline and make sure that you get all the answers back. If not, send a reminder again and collect it. Okay, although you cannot guarantee it will be 100% respond rate, but if you at least go for 80%, 85%, that will be actually great. Okay. So that is how you make sure you administer it and get the maximum of it. Okay, now let's go on to the actual questions, how you are going to design it, okay? Um, there are different types of questions that we use in questionnaires, okay? So we'll do examples one by one later, but there are questions called open questions, open-ended questions and closed-ended questions. Okay, I'll give you examples later. So you have to decide whether your questions are going to be open-ended, closed-ended, whether they are just to circle, tick, um, uh, if it is a electronic one, option boxes, check boxes, whether you give enough space to write down, okay? For a question, okay, you have to give these instructions and you have to make sure you pick the correct type of question, okay? So we'll sh I'll show you some examples and you will get an idea about what is an open question, what is a closed question and what are the differences, okay? 
and when to use circle one or check all that apply. Okay. So there are different type of questions like that. Uh, then the response, if you're asking for comments, okay, um, you can give a space to write the response or maybe you can get the response as a ranking, like I agree, disagree, uh, neutral, you know, things like that, okay? So the way you get the response, the option, that also you have to decide. Then the other important thing is the layout of the design. Okay, whether it should be nicely presented, visual presentation, that, that means not colorful uh, images or things like that. But when a person looks at your paper or your questionnaire, it should be not too long. It should be, you know, nicely spaced, clear uh, printing, uh, large enough font sizes, enough space to write, okay? And the order of the question. So the people will not uh, get jumbled up when they answer questions. Okay, so, and proper instructions also. Okay, there should be proper instructions. You should give the idea to uh, your respondents that this information are actually confidential. Okay, so you have to make sure you give that uh, impression or you give that message to your respondents, the confidentiality. Either you have to write it at the top all the data collected here are confidential and will not be shared with another third party, something like that. Okay, you can include it in the top of the questionnaire. Okay. See, here's an example about question wording. Sometimes you have the question in your mind, you know it because you are the one who's asking the question. But when you word it, since you already know the question, you may write it in a very... Uh, um, ambiguous way, like any luck. You ask any luck, but the person who's going to ask it, uh, luck, uh, any luck with what? See? Okay, so um, there's a problem here. But actually, it should be any luck with fishing because that person is fishing. Let's see. Um, you know, so because the respondents are not mind readers. Okay, so the respondents are not mind readers, they do not know what you are thinking. So not half in your paper, half in the mind, that's not going to work with questionnaires. You have to put all the things that you have into the paper, okay? Otherwise, it will be misleading and you won't get the exact answer that you want, okay? Okay, so here are the questions we are going to look at. The first one, open-ended questions. These are the questions that allow respondents to express their own idea and opinion, like the comments. Okay, so here's an example. What have you learned as a result of participating on the student board? Okay, suppose you are giving a questionnaire to um, a committee of uh, students who have served in a committee, student board. You are asking, what, yeah, what are your experience or what, is, what have you learned as a result of participating in the student board? Then the students will write their own opinion. Okay, so there are no choices given to select from. Your own idea, you can write it. So you have to give enough space to uh, write, maybe three or four lines. Those are called open-ended. Okay, open to any um, output. On the other hand, close-ended, you list the answers and the respondent will select one or many out of it. Okay, so the close-ended questions, you do not give any option uh, to the um, respondent. You give the answer choices and they will pick. Okay, sometimes it will be only one answer or it can be many. So multiple responses can be there, okay? So here's a, uh, the same question in both, in both open and close end, okay? So the same question, what have you learned as a result of participating uh, in the student board? And the same thing, the same question as a close ended, see you give the, um, uh, the answers, how decisions are made. So the student have learned how to make decisions, how a county board meeting runs, what issues are facing in the county, how to share your perspective in a public meeting. Okay, so these are the answers you give so accordingly to the person who's responding, they, they will tick maybe one, check all that apply, maybe all, maybe one student pick only one, two, okay, so according to that. So the respondent, has not given a chance to write their own opinion. You closed it with your own answers, they will tick. 
Okay, those are called closed end. Okay, but you can combine these two together. That is the best way. You can give it like that. this. See, you ask, what have you learned as a result of participating in the student board? Then you give the answers. They can pick what they want. And if there's anything else they have other than these options, they can write whatever the things there. So leadership, something like that. Okay, so they go tick and another other leadership. So this is actually a combination of uh, close-ended and open-ended questions. Okay, is this clear to all of you? <clears throat> Can you come up with uh, an example for close-ended question, open-ended question? I'll give you one example. Another example, okay? I hope you all are with me in the class. Okay, now uh, this session, it's we are not going to do any calculations or anything, so just listening, so maybe boring to you. Um, yeah, sorry about that, but we have to do it, okay? So do not fall asleep. Uh, I may ask questions at the end, okay? So make sure you are with me in the class. Okay, here's an example. Um, my question is, what is? The transportation mode you use come to the university. Okay, so if it is an uh, open ended one, you ask this question. Okay. And then you leave some lines. So they will write whatever the transportation mode they use. Or you can do it as a um, class standard question. So you write the question, what transportation mode? So this is the class standard one. Mm, what transportation mode you use? So you give it walk. Um, personal vehicle, train, bus, bicycle, okay, and you put right, maybe hired taxi, nowadays they are also popular, you know, put me, uh, yoga, and there are many, right? or maybe you don't know other. You leave a space, right? So one person may, you know, use a, a, the train and walk both and do that, right? Some person may hire a taxi uh, to come to the town and take a bus and then uh, get down from the Galha Junction and walk. So all three, okay? So, so maybe another person is using a friend's vehicle. So other, we use a friend's vehicle. Okay, so likewise, okay, you can. Make sure um, you get the out, uh, the output. It can be either open ended, closed ended. Sometimes uh, some questions are they have to be open ended if you need the opinion. Uh, closed ended will not be appropriate, but sometimes closed ended will do. But you have to make sure you give the other option. So if you miss any of the options that you have to pick, select, uh, you give the chance to the respondent to come up with their own option put in the other okay right so that is how you deal with open-ended and close-ended question so here are some uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages of open-ended question um, the pros you can get unintended or unanticipated results okay because you give the whole um, chance of answering the question to the respondent they can come up with whatever they want, their own honest opinion, okay? And you'll end up with a wide variety of answers, even the answers that you haven't think about, okay? And these answers will actually show the voice of your um, participants or respondents, their own voice, okay? Uh, but on the other hand, um, sometimes uh, it will be difficult to answer, okay? Uh, that means uh, when you analyze it, how do you categorize them? Okay, you'll end up with 
varieties of answers. So it is sometimes difficult to categorize them okay, and interpret them. Sometimes people uh, do not write anything. Okay? Even in the, uh, the reviews that we get from students about our you know, course material and teaching, uh, when they ask uh, to write any comment about the course or the teacher, hardly very few uh, students will write okay? anything. Uh, most of the time, these um, um, the the assess the what do you call them the review form they are uh, blank okay so people who do not like to write the open ended questions they are not going to be good okay now, if you look at the closed standard questions the most uh, uh, the advantage that is uh, 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 that comes with this is that easy to analyze. You already know the answers, so very easy to analyze, very easy to uh, categorize. And since you give the options, um, the respondent will recall, OK, yes, I got this also. Uh, OK, uh, say, for example, the, this one, uh, the respondent will recall, oh, yes, I, uh, I got the knowledge about how to make decisions. right? If this one was an open one, open-ended question, the respondent may never uh, get this into his or her mind, whether he used the decision-making, you know, that uh, ability, whether he got it because of participating in the board. But by looking at it, he thought, oh, yes, I got it, right? So that is the recall. Participant um, stimulate the recall. Um, the advantage is a chance of none of the choices being appropriate. You know, sometimes when you give these choices, there can be a person uh, who will not actually uh, have to take any of them. They, they, he or she does not see any of what he or she got from participating in the board. So that is why you have to put this other. Okay. So whatever missing here will be filled by the respondent. Okay. Okay. Um, you miss unintended outcomes, okay? So because you list it, uh, unless you give the option for other, you may miss some uh, outcomes, okay? So the goal of writing a good questionnaire is, now you are going to distribute a questionnaire to many people, 100 plus people. Although it was given to 100 people, you should have to make, you have to make sure that the question is understood by all of them in the same way. So that is what we'll, we say, we'll interpret in the same way. When you ask a certain question, the meaning of that question and the idea that each person get about this question, it should be same. They should know or they should identify, okay, this is the question they are asking. Everybody should get that same interpretation, okay? Unless that is not going to be a good question. If your question is understood by five people in five different ways, they are going to answer it in five different ways. So all of them are going to be useless. Okay, you have to make sure everybody understand the question in the same way. Okay. And the question should be um, phrased so the respondent can answer it accurately. Okay. Uh, they should, they, are, they get the ability to answer correctly according to the way you form your question and they are willing to answer. If your question is, you know, very using a lot of technical jargons and um, some uh, words that are very uh, sophisticated, okay? So by looking at the question, even the respondent will get upset or uh, you know, unwilling and just write something and finish it off. So it will be just the lack of willing to answer. So you have to make sure your questionnaire is nice and welcoming, okay? And this is something uh, people do most of the time, double-barreled questions. That means you asking, you're asking two things in the same question. You're asking two things or two questions in the, uh, in a one question, they are called double-barreled. Okay, here's an example. Do you feel that your skills in public speaking and leading new groups have increased as a result of this program? Now, what is the problem with this one? Can you see this person is asking two things? What is the first thing? 
developing your skills in public speaking. That is the first thing. The next one, the ability of leading new groups. Okay, so you are asking whether the respondent has increased the public speaking skills and also leading new groups. Now, for a person who actually increased the public speaking skills but never improved the leading new groups, so what is the answer he or she is going to give? Right, so this is a problem. You're asking two questions in one. One person will have yes for both, that person is okay. No for both, that is also okay. So you will see most of the time in a question like that, you will get the answer not sure because they do not know whether you have to fill the answer for the first one or the second one. That is a double barrel question. This is very misleading and the respondent will go blank. They do not know what to do, okay? So make sure you avoid it. You avoid double barrel questions. Do not ask two things in one, separate it. So you can ask it like this. Do you feel that skills in public speaking have increased? See, and split it. The next one, do you feel that your skills in leading new groups have increased? Now it is very clear. Only one question in, um, uh, in one phrase, okay? I hope this is clear to all of you. The next one is you have to avoid questions that some may not be able to answer. Yeah, that means actually the sequence. You have to, or you have to check the assumptions, right? Um, so here's an example. What type of internet connection do you have in your home? Now, what is the assumption in this question? You assume that, you assume that everyone has internet connection. You assume that every respondent in, who get this questionnaire, they have internet connection. Now the problem is, what if there is a respondent who's never used internet connection in their home? What is the answer that he or she is going to give? This is very misleading. Okay, so again, the respondent will go blank. They don't know what to write here. Okay, so what is the best way? You first ask, you check the assumption, do you have internet connection in your home? So a person who said yes, he will give the uh, internet connection type. Person who says no, he can skip the rest and go to the next question. So this is the best way to do it. Never assume. If you're going to assume some, something, ask it and get the answer from the respondent, okay? Here's another example. Um, this is also a very common one, okay? Another example. Uh, you ask, uh, you ask some questions and in somewhere middle you ask, uh, how many siblings do you have? That means how many brothers or sisters do you have? And you give a, you know, they can answer. Now, what is the question that you see here? Can anybody tell me what is the question that you see here? What is the problem with this question? What is the assumption that you make? I need some answers even at least to the chat. We assume that uh, the respondent, all the respondents have siblings. Yes, they have siblings. Uh, and uh, well, if you don't have, you can put zero. Uh, the more, the, the, the problem is whether they are alive or not. Okay, so that is one uh, problem. Uh, so you assume that they have siblings and they are alive. You are not asking how many siblings that do you have and they are alive? You know, they, are, you know, they can be, um, you have, um, um, uh, there can be a deaths in the family and you have missed them, right? So the best thing is you can ask, okay, as you have uh, given, you can ask, do you have siblings? Do you have siblings? And if they say yes or no, okay, if yes, you ask how many? Okay, so this is but oh ask do you have uh, siblings um, you know um, alive 
Okay, so you write only the, suppose you have, uh, suppose there is a person who has two sisters and two brothers, one brother is um, already deceased. So this person will write only two sisters and one brother. So you have to give that also number of you know, female siblings and male siblings. So they will write the number accordingly, maybe zero, maybe one, two, three, and also only the living siblings, right? So. If you have only one sibling and that person is deceased, unfortunately, then you have to put no, right? So that is how it will proceed. Another one is uh, you ask, what is your spouse name? Uh, not the name, what is your spouse's age? What do you assume here? What is the assumption? Whether the respondent is married or not, spouse means your husband or wife, right? So if it is a male, your spouse will be uh, the wife, and you can write the age of your wife. Okay, so if it is, if you are a, a female, your spouse will be a, your husband, right? But you assume here uh, the respondent is married. So first you have to ask, are you married? And even with that, um, uh, married can be, you know. Um, a single, widowed, uh, separate, divorce, that can also be there, okay? Uh, if, it, if you are not um, counting on them, you can just ask what is your spouse's age. But first you have to ask whether they are married or not, okay? So the, and even another one is uh, how many uh, kids do you have? Now before you ask that, you have to ask whether it is married and having kids, okay? If then only, you can write the number of kids you have. So that's also the sequence of the question and also checking the assumptions. Uh, so otherwise, the, your response will go blank. They do not know what to do. Okay. The next thing, uh, avoid jargons and technical language. Now, um, that is why when you do a pilot study, you will get these questions. Now, when you give these type of questions to your friends or uh, relatives, they will get the, uh, you know, you will catch these type of questions, okay? They will get blank and ask, well, what am I going to write in this question? Then you know, okay, I have to ask uh, the assumption first, okay? So that, that will be, you can catch these um, flaws in a pilot study, okay? So, and then we discuss about the jargons, the technical terms, what kind of SCT experience would you prefer to your child. Now, what is SCT? Science, Engineering, and Technology. So this is a technical term. Not many people know it, right? So better to write it as what kind of science, engineering, and technology experience would you prefer for your child, okay? So you have to avoid technical terms like that, okay? Uh, uh, imprecise questions. This is another one. Look at this example. How would you describe your experience as a Rotary Club ambassador? Uh, now, what is the problem with that one? It's, uh, you can see it if, when you write it in a better way. How would you describe your leadership experience while being a Rotary Club ambassador? Now, what is the difference? When you say your experience, you end up with several experiences, right? being a, um, an ambassador, Rotary Club ambassador. You, you, it may be about leadership, it may be about planning, time management, um, organization, many a type of experience. So you do not know how to answer this type of question. This is imprecise, so actually it is incomplete. But when you say, how would you describe your leadership experience? Now it is more clear, right? It's more clear than the previous one. So you have to be careful with things that you are going to get out from your respondent. So it is more specific now, okay? So you have to be very specific with your questions. Um, see, there's another one, avoid vague or ambiguous words. So here's an example. How many times did you eat together as a family last week? Okay, although uh, when you look at it, you don't see any problem, but if you look at the better way, how many meals did you eat together as a family at home last week? Now, what is the difference? 
you may go outside and eat you know you may visit a friend and eat. you may go to a picnic and eat outside home so you do not know how to count whether you include uh, eating outside also whether you include the, include the picnic also or whether you include the uh, the family gathering you had in uh, um, another place do you include that also so that is questionable to the respondent but when you ask how many meals did you eat together as a family at home this is very very precise okay so it is very easy to answer and it's more better if you it, it's better if you ask how many meals did you sit down to eat at home as a family okay so what what is the difference when you say you eat together you know you eat some are watching the tv some are in the kitchen some are outside the garden eating but if you sit together in the table and eat now that is different right nowadays very rarely people do that sit down in the table of all family and eating right so that is what this person is going to get out okay sit down to eat at home as a family not in everybody's room inside their own rooms or watching the tv okay not like that so this is more specific right um avoid specificity that limits the potential for reliable recall so what does that mean how many hours did you contribute to community service last year now what what about answering this type of question how many hours did you contribute to community service last year so if you think about a year 365 days 24 hours per day how many hours are there it's a long time period okay so if you are asking how many hours in the last year this is going to be a hectic question this person has to recall how many in january how many in february you know count it down write it somewhere add them together so most of the people will not answer this one because it's um, they need calculation they need lot of recall okay or they have to look at the records so this is not going to be easy so avoid this type of two specific questions so how do you avoid this type of question right how do you avoid it see um another problem is when you say community service there can be different type of community services right so that is also ambiguous uh, and when you say last year okay that is also ambiguous so it's better to give the year and sometimes uh and see another typos how many is as may so that is also you have to be very careful no typographical errors so a better way to give this is you may give um how many you may say hours per month on average right uh, maybe you give a, like this uh, less than uh, less than 5 hours uh, 6 to 10 hours uh, 11 to 15 hours more than 15 hours you know likewise if you give a categorization like that this is easy so they will tick accordingly they do not have to know the exact number precisely right just a range will to it right so this is how you can avoid this type of specific question right another mistake people usually do is asking the date the the age you ask the age yes months days now what is the problem with this one when you give a question asking the age in years months and days the respondent they have to sit down and calculate it right they should get their birthday the two days date do the subtraction number of days month years now do you think everybody will be able to do that no right they will be just approximate numbers they will put there so what is the best thing ask the date of birth don't ask don't uh, you know it's not good to ask the respondent to do calculations like this right you not you should not ask your responder to do the calculation you get the information and you do the calculation okay so that is the best practice you get the year month and date date of the date of birth and the day you analyze it or the day you collect it you have 
the today's date recorded somewhere. So when you analyze your data set, you do the subtraction from yourself, even you can use the Excel will do it for you. And you do the calculation and Okay, is everybody back? I think the connection was gone. Is everybody back? I guess so. Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Okay, so do not ask your respondent to do the calculation. Even they do it, it can be wrong. So you do the calculation, just get the information. So the best thing is to get the date of birth. You record the date of the, uh, the questionnaire data collection. Record this one and then you do the calculation, okay? <clears throat> and the other thing is avoid incomplete sentences. Uh, see, there's a, here's an example. You ask, what is your club? When you say your club, there can be several clubs that you are joined, right? So here's a better, what is the name of the Rotary Club you are currently attending, see? So avoid any incomplete sentences like this. Your city or town, when you say your city or town, this is again very um, ambiguous question. So is it asking about your birth city, the city you are currently living or the city you are uh, boarding at the, your boarding place, the city of your boarding place? Okay, so it is very uh, incomplete question. So what is the best way? In what city or town do you currently live? Okay, or your permanent residence. So that means not the boarding place. Okay, the permanent residence means where are your home is allocated, right? So you have to avoid these type of uh, incomplete sentences. Um, here's another example, people, uh, some, uh, you know, problems that people do or the uh, um, uh, uh, misleading questions that uh, uh, people do. Okay, when you ask the age in, uh, you know, give, uh, the age as a closed question, okay? You give the age range so they can uh, tick. So this is a very common way of uh, asking the age. Um, less than 25 years, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, 35 to 40, 42, let's say 60, 62, Now, suppose you gave a questionnaire asking the age of, let's say, patients in a clinic, and they are going to tick. The patient will tick their age, corresponding age, uh, the range uh, for he or her or his uh, corresponding age. Now, what is the, the problem with this one? There are a lot of problems in this formation, this question. Tell me few of them. So what is the first thing that you, what is the first problem that you see in this question? Now suppose you are answering this question. Who can find the problem with this question? Anybody? Uh, when I, I am 25, uh, yes, what yes. column? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, what is your name? Uh, who gave me the answer? Indika. Oh, ah, okay. Indika. Oh, uh, my friend. Okay, Indika. <laughs> right. Uh, always answering the questions. Right. So Indika is 25 years old, so he does not know where to tick. So you see, that's the first uh, problem that you should see. So how do you uh, correct this one? Make this 26, 30, 31, 36, 41, 61, and so on, okay? So that is a very common mistake. A lot of people do when they prepare questionnaires. So a person of 25, is, he will get lost here answering the question, okay? Now it is correct. What are the other problems that you see here? You have to have less than or equal 25. Otherwise, a person of 25, again, he will get lost, right? 
now it is better any other questions What are the other problems that you see here? You know, if my grandmother got this questionnaire, again, she will be lost. Any guesses? About eight years. About eight years. Anybody who's above eight years, again, that person is lost. How do you do? How do you solve this? So you can say greater than eight. Now this is OK, right? And again, if you think splitting it into five and 10, you know, starting from 36, 40, it is the gap is, uh, you know, 20 years. Okay, so it's better if you do the, you know, splitting in a um, more unique way rather than jumbling up with five to 10 to 20, right? So we should go for a, a better ranges than this, okay? Uh, uh, Another question like this, okay? Here's another example. Mm. Now, suppose uh, you are you had a workshop. At the end of the workshop, you give a questionnaire to get the feedback about the uh, workshop. And you're asking this question, mm. from where did you hear about this workshop, you know, the workshop is uh, you know advertised somewhere. So according to the advertisement, these people get registered. So you want to know what is the best way to advertise according to uh, the, you know, if you can find the largest number of people heard about this using a certain method, that means that's the best way to advertise, right? So you do it, you're going to find out uh, where did you hear about this workshop, okay. Now, suppose this is going to be a cross ended question and you give the answers. Um, you found it in a notice board um, from a friend in a newspaper advertisement. Or you received it via email. Um, or mm, what else? Mm. I suppose it is like this. Uh, let's see. Okay, this workshop. If you say tick one. Now this will happen. Um, this problem will occur if you do this. Okay, now suppose this is an online survey. Okay, you fill the online questionnaire at the end of the workshop. And you have uh, not the tick box, you have the option buttons. Okay, not the option button. So the, what is the difference between checkbox and option button? Checkbox can have multiple respondents, option buttons, only one, right? If you, if you click on one option button, the others will go away, right? But the checkbox, you can check all of them. Now suppose this is a, a, the online survey and you have to pick the one. Now what is the problem with this one? Now suppose you are the, person uh, answering this question. What is the problem with this question? Now you, you can choose only one because it is an option button. What will happen? What are the problems that you see here? Anybody? There should be another column, uh, others, other and answers there. Okay. like that. Yeah, that's, yeah. There should be a column with other answer. That is that because there can be a person who got the message from none of these four, some other way. Okay, we don't know some other way, right? Um, so from the supervisor maybe. The supervisor um, recommended to go to workshop, right? So better to have the other one, the other option, yes. What about the option buttons? What about you got this, your friend brought a newspaper and showed it to you. So what do you pick, friend or newspaper? 
or you saw the newspaper advertisement, uh, somebody, you know, cut it and put in the new artist board. So what do you pick, newspaper or notice board? You know, that's the question, right? So you have to, it's always good to have checkbox. That means you can tick uh, more than one option. So option buttons are not good in situations like that. So a person who uh, saw it in the newspaper, who gave it, a friend showed it to you, so you can pick both of them, right? So that is how you have to make sure your questions are not complete and not misleading, okay? So when you actually prepare questionnaires, you'll end up with a lot of these type of, you know, difficulties. That is why I said you have to, it will take a lot of time, many, many drafts. You write it, correct it again, write it again, correct it again, do a pilot study, correct it again, right? So you won't see these questions at the first time, but second, third, fourth, fifth draft, at the end, you will get the correct one, okay? Uh, the wording of the response is as important as clear wording in the question. So that is another thing, right? So when you have these open-ended questions, the way people write it, okay, that you can't control actually, uh, the way people write, sometimes they do not know how to put their thoughts into words. Okay, so sometimes it will be very difficult when you analyze them. Okay, but nowadays you have these sentimental analysis like word analysis, text analysis. Uh, there are technology that you can use, but still sometimes you may not get the clear answer from what they have written. Okay, so that actually we don't have any control of it, right? Um, what about this one? See, that's this is the question uh, we had in that age. How many times have you participated in the August fair? See, one, one, three, three, six. Person who participated three times, they do not know where to put here or tick here or here. I like that age example I gave you. This one is better, right? Okay, zero or never. See, a person who um, was never will pick this one and it has one also, so this is very wrong, right? You should avoid this. Never should always be alone, right? Never should always be alone. Okay, normal, something like this, right? So this is better than the poor spacing, right? Logical spacing. Uh, and what about this one? How often did you attend a club meeting during the past six months? Never, rarely, several times, many times. What do you think about this one? The problem is this how often? the way you define how often, past six months. So how many how many meetings are there? There will be, suppose it's a monthly meeting, there are a maximum six meetings, right? So for a person, one person, five meetings will be many times, right? Five meetings means many times, for another person, five meetings will be several times, right? And for a person attending one meeting will be several times, right? For another person, one, one meeting means a reality. So this how often it's very dependent, okay? So when you ask how often do you ice cream for one person, many times means, uh, you know, three times per week. For another person, reality is three times a week if he's eating ice cream a lot, right? So how often it's, it's depending on the person. This is a very biased one, right? The way you define never is very different from the another person defining never, right? Several times, the way you define several times, it's completely different from another person defining several times. So you cannot get exact answers from a question like this with these answers. But here's a better way. Not at all. So it is all along, zero is all along. More than five times, say three to five, one to two. So this is very nice logical way of splitting the, um, the how many times. So there are six, more than five means five or six. Okay. So five or six meetings, not, not at all, only one or two meetings, three to five minutes. So this is very nice way of splitting it. Okay, so if you compare these two, you can clearly see the difference. So this is better, right? Um, see, this is uh, the mutually exclusive responses as I mentioned uh, here. Right, the notice board, friend, newspaper, right? See, <clears throat> from which one of these source did you first learn about the Rotary Club? A friend, neighbor, relative? Again, there can be, your neighbor will be your relative, your neighbor will be the friend, right? 
or you see the you see it at the school in the notice board so you know so there can be several answers right so you have to be mutually exclusive that means there cannot be overlapping so mutually exclusive means no overlapping <clears throat> okay there cannot be any overlaps in your answers okay mm -hmm. Uh, here's another one. Include both positive and negative sides in the question and all possible answer options. Now, what about this one? Do you agree that the Rotary Club needs to meet once per month? Agree or disagree? But there can be people who do not care whether they meet once per month or not. So that means the neutral set, okay, in, in between set. So they do not have a say in this type of question. So what is the better way? There should be a no opinion one also. So, so those who have no agreement or disagreement on whether how many times they should meet, they can click no opinion. Okay. Or another one, another better way is so like this once per month, more than once per month, less than once per month. So this is even better, right? So you have to be careful when you give these close type of questions, right? Um, um, I don't think that I'll be able to finish everything today. Anyway, we'll try. Uh, you have to uh, keep the scaling and uh, the order. Okay, so uh, it's better if I show you an example and anyway, the rating scales. Uh, always include a label for each scale category. Now, this is about scaling. Uh, questions such as where you have uh, strongly agree, agree, uh, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Those are the scaling type of questions. Okay, you see, uh, you have a certain set of questions at the top. You have to tick the rating or the scaling, right? Uh, strongly agree. Agree. Neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. So you see a clear order in this one. You start with strongly agree and go to the strongly disagree. And it is always included this neutral option. Okay, so that will allow those who are not in either side, negative or positive side, they have a say, the neutral. Okay, so always there should be odd number of um, options. Okay, if you have even number of respondents, it's like taking a side. If you have only agree, disagree type, so it is always taking a side. So those who tick on this side, they all agree. This side, they all disagree. So they always take a side, left or right side. But when there's odd number of, the, um, you know, um, scaling with the neutral, there are no sides, right? So those who are in, not in either side, they have a say. So you have to be very careful. Or you can go for three, agree, neutral, disagree. That is also okay. Sometimes you go for seven. You can put, you know, um, highly disagree and highly agree, okay? You know, more options, seven. Again, odd number, okay? So you should go for, um, four is not good actually three, five, usually it is three and five. Seven is too much. Usually it's three or five, okay? Um, again, the same thing, the rating. See, here's an example. What do you think about this one? How are you going to rate the experience as a youth mentor? So what do you see? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. Now, what is the problem with this one? All these first four are in the positive side, right? And only one for the negative. So this is not a, this is in balance. The rating is in balance, in balance rating. So this is not good. There are four choices for the positive side and only one for negative. This is not good. So here's the better one. Very good, good, fair, poor, very poor. So these are in the positive, these are in the negative, and this is like in between. This is a nicely, a well-balanced rating. Okay, so that you have to be very careful. 
okay and also they match okay um, see you can compare these two also right uh, and also you have to keep the scale con uh, the consistent like uh, sometimes you end up with set of questions let's go back here suppose you have five questions in this category right and another set another five and if you uh, if you are going to uh, give the rating for the next five make sure you give it in the same way you do not start with you know disagree side here and go to the agree so you uh, reverse the scale now what will be the problem here usually in questionnaires you will see these type of tables three or four times so if you do first three starting from strongly agree to strongly disagree and suddenly the last one you reverse it from disagree to agree what will happen because the the respondents they are more you know practiced now with this scaling from left to right without even looking they will tick and you'll end up with wrong answers the strongly agree side is now here left right changed so do not do that avoid any uh, reversing okay the rating scale it should be uh, balanced and it should be the same direction all the time okay so that you have to do uh the scale should be consistent uh, see uh, sometimes you ask your respondent to rate 1 to 4 1 to 5 or even 1 to 10 sometimes 0 to 5 but you have to make sure what is the meaning of 1 to 4 whether it is increasing or decreasing okay so sometimes you avoid the label you only give the first one and the last one in between you do not you this is incomplete so it's better always you give the full label. One means great deal, two somewhat, three not much, four not at all. Maybe not all, not on all tables, but at some place give this uh, labeling so they know how to fill correctly. Okay, do not uh, give incomplete labels. Okay. Mm. Uh, one more thing. Uh, sometimes. Uh, you know, there are questions, uh, the negative and positive type of questions. Negative and positive type of questions are there. You should not, uh, you should not uh, mix them up. Okay, Here's, here are some examples. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose this is about rating a, a certain course module. Okay. Course module. Uh, and you are going to put this uh, strongly agree, agree, that table is there. You are going to rank, okay? Let's say agree, uh, neutral, disagree. So the first one is content is satisfactory. Assignments are useful. Third one. Um, uh, let's say practical levels are uh, let's say enough let's say how do you say it a uh, number of practical levels are satisfactory or practical levels are sufficient or um, Study hours are not enough. Now, what is the problem with this set? You see positive questions, one, two, and three positive questions, and suddenly you end up with a negative question. Study hours are not enough or insufficient. Now, what is the problem with this one? Person who's, got, who's very satisfied about this course, he'll put, okay, the satisfy, agree, assignment, useful, agree, practical hours, agree, study hours, I get. now it will be agree here. Because this is, a, you know, the practice, right? Suddenly you reverse it and it should go here, right? Study hours are insufficient, disagree, because if, if this course is actually a good one, now see, with the reverse, you'll get a wrong answer. So you should avoid positive and negative questions mixed up. 
So if you have negative questions, put them in a separate table. Okay, so always do that. If you have positive questions, put them in one table, the negative questions another table. Make sure you have the correct scaling and order. Oh, always, oh, what you can do is avoid all negative questions and rewrite them in positive. Okay, so you can say study hours are sufficient. So that is positive. If it is insufficient, the person will say disagree. So no problem, right? Or either you use all negative, all positive, don't mix them up or split the positive into one table and negative into another table. Okay, so make sure you do that. And the next thing is the look is everything. Looks, that means uh, make, uh, leave plenty of space, uh, nicely margin, nice in instructions. Okay, the question should be clear, uh, nice instructions. This is very important. You should give instructions at the beginning, how to fill it. Uh, the fonts are nice, easy to read. Okay, uh, the font sizes is consistent throughout the paper and not too long. Okay, so that is something very important, not too long. Otherwise, somewhere in between, respondent will get lazy and just fill it up without even reading the question, right? Uh, this is again about uh, formatting. Um, see, uh, you see the paper sizes and everything. You can just read them. Okay. See the font sizes, uh, the best font size to use. And then again, you can double check, right? So I think that covers important things that you have to follow when you prepare a uh, questionnaire. Okay. So I think I covered uh, almost all the things, but now, uh, so that's the end of chapter one. So I'll upload all the material for chapter one together. So read these slides leisurely, look at the examples. Uh, you can, what you can do is go online and look at some available online surveys and check what are the um, problems that you say there. If you, are, if you are going to design it, how will you uh, modify it? Okay, how will you improve it? Look at these things. Uh, try to check um, the errors, catch the errors in questionnaires. Okay, so you can do that. There are a lot of available questionnaire samples. Uh, they are in the internet. So look at them and see whether you can improve those questionnaires or whether they are good or bad. Okay, you can look at it by the things that you have learned. But the most important thing is until you prepare your own questionnaire, you will not know how to apply these things. So the best thing is you have to prepare some questionnaire by yourself. Okay, so if I do this in a, uh, in a class, I'll do it as a group work, okay, but in this setup, we can't do it. Uh, but maybe when we meet, we'll do it as a group work, okay, but look at these topics and try to come up here with your own questionnaire. Okay, not all of them. You can choose a one that you like, or maybe two. Try to prepare a questionnaire. Uh, if I give this as an assignment, an online assignment, will you be able to upload it with a deadline? Uh, prepare the questionnaire. I, you know how to prepare you know, a Word document and uh, upload it as an assignment, right? So I'm sure you can do that. Uh, you can pick whatever the topic you want out of these five. Uh, anyway, I'll upload that assignment for you, then you can submit it, okay? So meanwhile, uh, you know, try to come up with some questionnaires for these, uh, these topics. If you have friends uh, you know, keeping the distance, uh, you can discuss in, and do it as a group work, but I do not recommend with this current situation working in groups. Mm, but if you can discuss over the phone or something like that, well, it's okay to discuss, right? Any question so far? So again, go over these slides and until you do it by your own, you sit down and write, prepare a questionnaire by your own, you will not know the difficulty of that. So I, I, I encourage you to prepare your own questionnaire okay, for those topics. Refer the internet, there are more than enough uh, examples you can look at, okay? And follow the instructions, uh, the things we discussed today, type of questions, the flow, uh, how to avoid um, jargons, incomplete questions, the way you uh, define the calculations, avoiding it, okay, things like that. 
and also how to make it confidential, giving instructions properly. Okay, so make sure you follow these things and try to uh, prepare your own questionnaire, practice it. Okay, and this will be very useful when you do your final year project. A lot of the time, most of the time, your fourth year project, you may have to prepare a questionnaire. So this will be a good, good practice. Okay. Any other question? Okay, then shall we uh, finish for today? So again, I will upload the whole chapter one um, slides for you. Um, okay, we have one question. If you provide a questionnaire online, can't we send it to a number of greater than the sample size because of response rate? Yes, that you have to do. If you are sending your questionnaire online, always the response rate will be very few. Therefore, although you have, suppose your sample size, the minimum sample size you want is 150, do not send it to only 150, at least send it to 200. Otherwise you won't be able to collect 150. Okay, so that's a very good question. Thanks for asking it. Um, uh, yes, you have to do that. You have to send to more than the number of um, more than the sample size you have. Otherwise, you'll end up with less because of the response rate. Okay, so that's good. Good question. Thanks. Um, so if you end up with the sample size even 50, if you send it to 100, okay, so that's better. Because if you do it online, you know, you don't have postal charges or anything, it's free. Okay. So identify the appropriate groups in your sample and send it to many. So you'll end up with the uh, enough sample size at the end. Yes, okay. Any other question? And if you end up with a larger response rate, that's better, right? Sample size becoming better, it's always better. Okay, you define the minimum sample size because of the time constraints or uh, cost, uh, you know, things like that. But if you can collect data more than the sample size you decided, it's better. That's that's not a problem. Although you start with sample size 100 and you got 150 response, use it. More data is better. More data, better. Okay. So um, if you if you exceed your sample size with the response, that's better. Okay. So use it. No problem with that. High better. Higher the sample size, better your analysis. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to stop sharing and uh, I will upload them.